Uh, thank you for inviting me to, uh, this is, looks like a great conference, and uh, uh, I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the role of visual, visualization and the discovery and the commercialization of the Marcel Shale play, uh, but I also want to talk about what you guys do uh, as uh, GIS and scientists, and uh, I think I'd like to show you a little bit of the role I think that you've all played in making this discovery and commer commercialization uh, reality. And... Uh, I'm going to start by showing uh, maybe where the oil and gas in the exploration industry was uh, when Mark and I first started in the business and what was norm for that time and what was uh, driving the business. And uh, I'll spend a you know, little bit of time talking about the Marcellus discovery and uh, the challenges there. And uh, uh, then I'd like to show you where I think uh, we've evolved as a, a, as a technical group and maybe uh, show you some of the challenges that are, that are ahead. Where did it all start? Well, I love this slide because it is part. This was a map that uh, our group at Mark Resources in and Mark uh, actually did, and uh, this was all done with our pretty got pens and lithographs. And I had a picture of Mark that I considered showing at this at his desk, but uh, once you start showing pictures in the past, he was going to show a few of me and. I probably was 30 pounds lighter, and I don't want to start that stuff. So, uh, But it was really interesting. I just found this, and I was looking for things to talk about um, uh, for another uh, presentation, and I came across all these old slides, and we had like six or eight people sitting at a desk working with rapidograph pens and doing the, uh, all that Leroying stuff, and that, that was normal back then. I don't even think a GIS program was developed yet. I don't even think contour geologic mapping was uh, automated at that time. It was just starting to happen my first couple of years in there. This slide, and uh, I'm not much the one to use a mouse pointer, so I'm going to start here. Uh, this map shows the production of the Appalachian Basin at the time that we published this map, maybe about 1985. And all the different colors represent oil and gas production from different horizons. And the Appalachian Basin oil and gas industry really didn't start with the Colonel Drake. It started in 1821 with the Fredonia shale gas discovery. And that was the first use of uh, unconventional shale gas. It's not a new thing. It's an old thing. And actually, the Appalachian Basin was the birthplace of that. That uh, lit the town of Fredonia and then lit a lighthouse. Well, the Devonian shale gas uh, industry developed all kind of production along the Lake Erie shoreline that governed in industry from uh, 1860s through the early 1900s. Uh, in 1859, that's when the Drake discovery was made, and that's generally considered the petroleum industry's birthplace. And that was a, another, that was a major technological innovation. Uh, in, in 1921, this giant Big Sandy field here was found in Kentucky, and that, at, for the longest time, was one of the largest gas fields in the world. And that was out of Devonian Shale, which is closely related to what we do in the Marcellus. Now, in 2004, in Washington County, that was generally the, considered the birthplace of the uh, Marcellus uh, discovery. Uh, that's a big milestone. And then in 2010, this is generally the Ohio, Eastern Ohio is generally considered to be the birthplace of another play that uh, is related to the uh, uh, shale gas, the Utica Point Pleasant. Now, what's interesting, all this production was generated from, I, I want to say, hundreds of thousands of wells. And over 150 years, I believe that the number I researched for the production over that time was about 59 to 60 trillion cubic feet of gas equivalents. And that's just the gas and oil that was recorded. There was a lot of flaring. There was a lot of, not a lot of good records taken at that time. But over 150 years and 60 trillion cubic feet, we believe that the Marcellus and individual companies are going to be able to outproduce that tenfold. You would think you'd have a declining asset and you would think you wouldn't be able to find oil and gas and this was something that was going to uh, not be repeated. In fact, we've not just repeated it, we've improved it uh, in, uh, by an order of magnitude. Well, the first uh, indications of the interest in shale gas in the Marcellus uh, was started to uh, be documented by uh, the Eastern Gas Shales Project, and this is about when I started uh, working in the business in 1980. 
And this was some work that was done by the uh, Pennsylvania Geologic Survey in conjunction with the uh, uh, government in, in industries. And you can see here shown on here, there was uh, early indications of potential from the Marcel Shell. Uh, but th they knew there was gas there and they knew it was pervasive, but they didn't have the ideas and technology to be able to commercialize it. And there was numerous attempts. Uh, here's a map uh, taken from the geologic survey that uh, shows the location of uh, a gas well. And if you read this well record, and uh, I went, I poured through thousands of these. That's part of what we do in our, in, uh, as exploration geologists. And you would think that someone reading a, a well record saying gas blows at 10 different uh, depths there and a gas blow, blowout blew tools up the hole and kinked several hundred feet of drilling line would get your interest. That well was, has never been offset until the last uh, four or five years. Uh, that was a common uh, gas show and description of a gas show that was found in the Marcellus, but there were so many attempts to treat it that were not commercially successful, that it was in everyone's psyche that it'll never be, uh, it'll never be produced, or yeah, it's got gas, but we can't make it work, so go on to work on something else. And this, this was all data that was available to us as explorationists, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Now, in 2004, a lot of things were happening in the, in the uh, oil and gas industry. Uh, the, one of the most important ones of them was uh, the commercialization of the uh, Barnett Shale in uh, Texas. Now, if you look at that uh, map, and these maps are to scale, that, that map uh, is a geo-reference image from the AAPG publication showing the Barnett uh, Shale in the lo lower right-hand corner. And at that time, in 2004, they just had uh, commercialized that play, and they just, had perf they just had gotten to a point where they were starting to do horizontal drilling. Now, between 2004 and 2008, that became the largest gas field in the United States. In 2004, this was a map that the, I think Chris Pons at our office helped uh, make this for me. This is a, a map that shows our guess at, about that time of what the prospective area of the Marcellus could be. And we were really arm waving on this. This is a really broad based map that, that uh, covers a lot of area. But the first thing you can see on the productive area of the Marcellus versus the productive area of the Barnett, that's roughly a tenfold difference. So. Early on, you know, it was an interesting, Marcellus is an interesting play, generated a lot of interest just from its sheer size. But this map is correct in it. If that red area had no commercial uh, production in it. It had numerous wells that had penetrated the formation in some attempts to uh, treat it, but none of them were commercial. So in 2004, the uh, Barnett was a commercial large gas field that was the uh, springboard for all the other new shale plays uh, that uh, came after it, and the Marcellus was just an idea. So in 2000, uh, in the year, about the year 2000, uh, Range and the predecessor company I worked for, uh, Great Lakes Energy, we had gotten involved in uh, Washington County in the year 2000 to explore for uh, uh, oil and gas from the deeper Trenton Black River Formation, which was below the Marcellus, and we also found a prospect that we wanted to test in uh, Washington County that looked like it had potential in the uh, Silurian Lockport Dome at about 8,000 feet. So in 2003, we drilled this uh, well, and this rig is showing the uh, Wrens well as it was being drilled in 2003. And we got to our original target at 8,500 feet, which was below the, the Marcellus. We had gas shows going through the Marcellus, we had big gas shows at the target formation. We had thought we had to make the biggest discovery in my career, and next thing you know, it didn't work. We tried to drill that deep discovery horizontal. It didn't work. We tried to recomplete some zones up hole. It, it didn't work. And about that time, we had about six and a half million dollars into it, and then we hired a new CEO, and then they go, well, who's this guy that's responsible for Washington County? Everyone step back, and I'm here. <laughs> so I had an OS moment at that time. But, uh, you know, about that time, and it, it, it's, it's about how I felt. 
but uh, I believed in the area, and I really, you know, the discoveries are, are hard to make, and uh, you know, th you know well, finding oil and gas is not easy. Uh, but ab about that time, I had the lucky uh, chance to uh, go visit a friend of mine in uh, Houston, Texas, and at that time, I had thought I knew about the Marcellus. We had recognized all these gas shows that I had shown. Uh, but I, I never thought it was a commercial play. I believed everything that the engineers were telling me or just ourselves that, you know, maybe you can make a, 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 a small gas well out of it, but it wasn't the reason why we were there. Well, I go visit a friend in uh, Houston, Texas, who's trying to uh, sell us a uh, project in Alabama, and it's in this shale called the Neal Shale. And uh, I looked at the guy's work, and it really well done work. And I'm uh, asking him, I said, this is real interesting, but why is it important? What's your analog? What, what are you trying to repeat? And he showed me the Barnett Shale work, and that was before it was even horizontal. And I looked at his Barnett Shale work, and I go, oh, my gosh, I'm going to spend some more money. <laughs> and, and I looked at what we did. And all this time, you know, you think after all these failures after failures that maybe you should maybe just quit while you're ahead. This was so fascinating what they were doing in the Barnett. I brought it back to uh, Jeff and Tora and some of our guys at the work. And uh, surprisingly, you know, they, you know, they weren't worried about the money the way I was. They were worried about making discoveries. And between the year uh, 2003 and 2004, we researched uh, the shale a lot. What we ended up doing uh, was, you know, after we ran the seismic to drill the original well that failed, we saw the show, and this show in the Marcellus was quite large. It just wasn't sustained. But in October 2004, we did the first uh, large commercial frack of the Marcellus on October 22nd, I believe it was. And that frack that you see there that looks commonplace these days was a major logistic undertaking. Uh, nothing like this of this scale had ever been done and it took a lot of work by the engineers to coordinate this. And, but they put the, a large hydraulic frack that was the same scale that they were doing at the Barnett at that time. And uh, believe it or not, first time we did it, we got a relatively successful try, which, which is enormously a big blessing. But in a statistical play, uh, you have to be willing to go and drill three, five, ten wells to get some measure of success sometimes. We were lucky enough on this first one to get enough success for us to want to go forward on a early basis. So 2004 is generally recognized industry-wide as the first commercialization of the Marcellus as a play, but on a vertical well. That's not the well or the time that made the Marcellus economically successful like you see right now. That took more work and more money. In 2005, based on that work, uh, we compiled all the uh, data we had from the uh, USGS and the various uh, government agencies, did a lot of work in uh, ArcMap and ArcView, and did uh, and just kind of came up with an optimum fairway for leasing. Uh, we had gotten enough uh, information from the Renswell at that time that we wanted to be uh, what we, you know, in the industry call a first mover. Uh, first mover gets the first opportunity to get the leases at the lowest prices and with the lack of competition, but you're taking all the financial risk. It's very expensive uh, to be the one doing all the exploration because nobody has the experience and uh, there's a lot of lessons that need to be learned and they're expensive. We drilled, between 2005 and 2007, we drilled uh, three horizontal wells. And the first horizontal well was not any better than the vertical well. That's what's shown. The star on this map was the vertical well I showed you the rig on. The numbers I'm showing you here are offsetting it. The first one that we did, number one here, that 300 MCF per day on a horizontal well was 10 times more expensive than the vertical well and no better. It only made 300 MCF per day. Here we are spending more money again. The second well we did, uh, it shows on here, basically made zero. The third well made 600 MCF per day. So about this time, the real numbers of our group and our exploration was approaching $150 million. And that's how much 
uh, faith and vision that Jeff and Tora and some of the other pioneers had uh, with this to uh, break the code on this formation. The, but by the third horizontal, it wasn't broken yet. It took the fourth horizontal to make a slight change in the landing target and with some other changes that made the Marcellus fourth well as commercial as a horizontal well in the Barnett. And that was when we personally knew that we had got what we were looking for. And then the next thing we had to do was drill several offsets to see if it was repeated. Now we were keeping all that information uh, quiet for competitive reasons until the end of the year. And at that time, we made the announcement to the public. We're a publicly traded company. We owed it to our investors and so forth, shareholders, to state where we were. And when we made our announcement at the end of the year in 2007, that's when uh, the announcements were made uh, in the following year by Penn State and other people with the anticipated reserve potential in the Marsalis. And that was the watershed moment for the, the Marsalis shale was those uh, repeatable horizontal wells combined with the reserve estimate. So that that point in time happened about two, you know beginning of 2008. Look where we've come in a, that amount of time. This map is the same map, and in several years, six years, several years, Marcellus has become the largest gas field in the United States. That's producing 11 billion cubic feet of gas per day. That bypasses the Barnett that we thought was the analog. And if you look at the, the reserve estimates, uh, Dr. Terry Engelder from uh, Penn State, he has the probably the most published one, the largest one at 489 trillion cubic feet. The lowest one that the USGS uh, does is about 84 trillion cubic feet plus oil. If you plot out those estimates against the 15 top gas fields in the world, it puts the Marcellus about number two. And that's why this is so big. That's why all industry and all eyes are on Pennsylvania. And all this work that you've seen, all these dots on the map here represent work that the, you know Chris has put on, not just the permits, but the actual producing wells. All these expansions of these fields and the evolution of something that was an idea and uh, unproven in 2004 has now become a reality. How did we get there? Well, you know, what does it take to make a discovery like this? And, and I'm just going to show a couple slides just to show you a couple of different things, how I visualize things, uh, just as an example, how many different scales a geologist has to work with. And then I'm going to show some examples of what does a company have to work with visually to see how this discovery is uh, not only uh, planned but realized. First thing, one of the first things that we do as exploration geologists is we have to work on a regional scale. Uh, this is a regional map of the Marcella shale play, uh, and it shows the thermal maturity. The thermal maturity is the degree of cooking in the shale. Uh, you can have a shale like the Marcellus uh, that has a real high organic content, but if it hasn't been uh, buried uh, to a proper depth and subjected to a certain temperature, it never generates the gas and the pressure, uh, the reservoir never gets created. And so we map out fairways of uh, basically the cooking of the shale, and that's what this shows here. And overlaid with that are the, uh, now after the fact, this is the wells and the well quality, and you can see from the map where the two core areas in the Marcellus are shown here, one in northeast Pennsylvania and the other one in southwest Pennsylvania and northern West Virginia. Another thing that we have to look at as a geoscientist is... Uh, the seismic and how the uh, wells fracture the microseismic. So what this this is showing you, this is a surface of the Onondaga limestone, which is immediately below the Marcellus. These lines here are the well pads from a Marcellus well. And then these dots and circles are the microseismic events that are measured while they're fracking the uh, Marcellus. And it shows you where those how far down those uh, fracture going and how far up. And you can see that this Tully limestone is about where most of the uh, frac energy is contained. We work at the log scale, at the well scale. This, uh, you know, we work with thousands of these uh, logs to measure how much oil and gas potential is in the Marcellus. And 
we've gone now from not only at the regional scale, we work on this, uh, these visualizing this formation as potential done at the uh, nanometer scale, at the micron scale, size of human hair. And look at these images every day. We're learning something every day that we use to help solve the code on this. That's just the geoscientist side of it. I've shown you three of probably a hundred different ways we look at it. How do we, how do we as a company or how do are we as an industry look at the development of this play? It's a huge task. Well, the first thing that I'll show here, this, this is an example uh, at the managerial level. We plan things. Let's, let's spend money. Let's drill wells. It's, it's easy, isn't it? No, it's not easy. But this is an easy map to show to start. This is the field that developed uh, from that Renz well. And you can see it uh, spans quite a few wells now. And we got this map show on the leases, the different uh, BTU fairways. And just to show what goes into developing a field at this level, I'm going to show some examples. It starts with staking a well. Now, look at how many different places we can stake a well, how many different roads, how many different farms, how many different buildings, zoning. You can look at all the different requirements you have to do to successfully site a well so you can fit a, a four and a half acre uh, drill site on it and look at all the things you have to manage in real time. Within that same unit, you have within that same well site, you have to manage not just one lease. Most of the time, especially in southwestern Pennsylvania, the average track size of a uh, lease to make a unit is 20 acres. So how many 20 acre tracks go into a 640 acre unit? A lot. And every one of these has its own unique uh, mineral ownership and unique story to it. And all this stuff, you know, if you're trying to have a 100 to 2 or 300 well program, Think of all the decisions and uh, situations you have to manage on a map level to, to manage this. We have to uh, look at the old uh, well histories of the area here. There's thousands of uh, old oil and gas wells in, associated with uh, the, uh, the activity of the uh, late 19th century and early 20th uh, that have to be factored in when we're doing these modern operations. And then we have to have uh, uh, all our compliance with safety, uh, government, and uh, regulatory bodies. All this stuff has to be done real time that is on a scale that, uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, I didn't think was possible. Now we're developing uh, tools that uh, all those maps I showed you, we work within our GIS and the geology department, and we would uh, develop what we call long-range plans, and we would physically look at every one of our leases and every one of our opportunities, and every everyone would draw the lateral on where they thought the horizontal well could go. And the problem with that process is one of it changes. One lease goes away. A new lease comes on. Someone says, I don't want a lease. I don't want your... I don't want your well to go northwest, southeast. I want it to go north, south. Every stick that you change, it upsets the whole house of cards. So what we've been able to do, not uh, us as a, a company, but as an industry, uh, the software in, is developing that we can develop these large gas fields and manage them in real time. We don't get to this discovery without the integration of all these different things. And I could fit a hundred different processes that you all have to manage and do in real time and map time. But that really is the key to success, is uh, the rapid and efficient way of integrating all these things. And be able to do that cheaply, quickly, and uh, in a way that's uh, easily uh, transferable to, to management level and other different departments, your engineering, your health and safety, uh, land. Every group has their own language, their own way of doing things, and your, your ability to uh, show the maps and integrate and speak the same language to, to each group is what makes these large fields, I think, uh, successfully possible. So with that, I'm going to close, and this is what I think you all do every day. 
And this is really what's fascinating to see how far we've come in the last uh, 10 years or so. And it'd be interesting to see where we are 10 years from now. So I appreciate the time and enjoyed the story.